decision and we'll have somebody get in touch with you. I've got some literature I want you to have. All you have to do is type 51555 in the word decision and I'll get that uh, material to you. Somebody will text you right back within just a few moments. Growing up, we lived, at least my generation, uh, we lived under the red threat. The Russians were coming, right? And uh, we were prepared for it. Uh, we built up a military, uh, we strongest military in the world, and finally, uh, the Cold War came to an end. The Russians and the communists uh, failed, they lost, we won, and uh, we began to sigh a, a sigh of relief. While we were taking that sigh of relief, secularism crept in to our federal government. It crept into our state government. It crept into our local governments. And secularism and communism, there's no difference. They're both godless, okay, godless. And, and what's happened is godlessness has come into this nation of ours whose foundations were built on biblical principles. Our laws, all that we have has come from God. And the secularists are wanting to take it away. They're wanting to take God out of government, take him out of our schools, take him out of our society. And he wants the rest of us, they want, the progressives want to push us off to the side. Well, I'm here today to say I'm not going without a fight. Now, maybe you have come today and you are wanting to know, well, what can we do? Okay, well, let's get into it. Be willing this next election to vote, okay? Vote for candidates that stand for biblical truth and biblical principles and that are willing to live them, okay? Amen. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. But I'm asking you to vote. Do it. This is the key. We get out and vote. America is being stripped of its biblical heritage and God-inspired foundations. Some may ask the question, Franklin, what would your father have done? I hear that all the time. <laughs> I believe if he were my age today, he would be doing exactly the same thing. See, when my father went to school, the Ten Commandments were on the wall of the school. Kids, whether they believed it or not, at least they had a standard. They knew what was right and wrong. When my father went to school, the, the teacher led every morning in the Lord's Prayer. Whether the kids believed it or not, at least the example was there before them. And every morning, when my father went to school, they said the Pledge of Allegiance. Many schools don't even do that anymore. You see, it's all gone. But here's something my father said in 1976. Get involved in the political process. He said, this coming year is a, an election year. I would like to challenge every deeply committed American who is qualified to think about running for political office. I do not believe that we as Christians should withdraw. Right. We need men and women of integrity, Christian, Christian commitment, who will run for political office this coming year, no matter which political party you belong. He says in 1952, I think it's the duty of every individual Christian at election time to study the issues and candidates and go to the polls and vote. Amen. He said, it is the duty of Christian men and women to offer themselves for public office. One reason, he said, we have had such bad political leaders is because in some places only the bad ones offer themselves for office. There are many places in which Christian men and women 
could get the vote if they only offered themselves. Daniel, in the Bible, lived in one of the most heathen countries in the world, but he was prime minister under seven kings in two empires. Amen. We need Daniels today. Amen. My father went on to say, he said, if I were a pastor, if I were a pastor of a church, I believe I would explain to my people where each candidate stood morally, spiritually, and in relationship to the church. I feel that we're going to have to meet our political obligations as Christians and make our voices known if America is to be preserved with a type of Christian heritage that has given us the liberties we now enjoy. For unless America turns back to God and repents of its sin and experience a spiritual revival, we will fail as a nation. I believe God honors leaders in high places who honor him. It is the easiest thing in the world for us as Christians to think of national world politics as something involving only men and women of the world. That's where we fail. Our job as Christians is to make the impact of Christ felt in every phase of life, religious, social, economic, and political. But we must not do it in our own strength or wisdom. We can only do it as we surrender ourselves completely to God, allowing Him to work in us. The choice may not always be clear. You may have to choose one of the best or one who most closely represents biblical values. Again, the choice may not always be clear. We talk about national elections, but I want to remind you what some of the most important elections are. Mayors, city council, county commissioners, judges, school boards. Could you imagine that in the next two or three election cycles that the majority of the mayors and city councils of America were born again Christians, the impact that that would have on this nation and our cities. Our county commissioners be men and women of God. The school boards, how important it is for Christians to run for school boards. If men and women of God control the school boards of America, think of what that would have for the next 20 years, the impact on the education system of this nation. We need men and women to run for office. We need you to vote for men and women who are Christians, who are willing to stand and believe and follow biblical principles. So where do we go from here? Begin by forming prayer groups. Every one of them. Go back to your homes, back to your communities, and form a prayer group. And begin to pray for your community. And, and bring people into your prayer groups that may be of different political persuasion, different ethnic backgrounds, different races, but who are committed and have the same bond as you do to the blood of Jesus Christ. Look for people within your community, Christians, you can persuade to run for various positions in your community and then get behind them, Amen. help organize them, campaign for them. But it must be men and women who support, live, and believe the Word of God. Amen. It's estimated that in the last election, 20 to 30 million evangelical Christians did not vote. They stayed home. Many times I've heard people say, well, my vote doesn't count. Uh -huh. <laughs> really? In 1974, the New Hampshire race for the U.S. Senate seat, John Durkin versus Louis Wayman, Republican, uh, 
Wayman wins by 355 votes. We have a recount. Durkin wins now by 10 votes. We have another recount. <laughs> Wyman wins now by two votes. The Democrat-led Senate declares the seat vacant with no winner. They said it was the closest call in Senate history. Uh, they had a special election, and Durkin won by 27,000 votes. But don't tell me your vote doesn't count. In 2004, Montana race for state house, 